Good morning. So glad you joined us this morning. And I know, well, there's probably something maybe better on Facebook to watch or something on TV or maybe, you know, going somewhere. But I know that if you stick on this page, God is going to speak to you. So that's my prayer that this morning you will hear a word from our living God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that even in these times, through technology, we can pre-record these. And Lord, still you show up. Lord, you do anything. You can do anything. And you do do anything. You do the things that we don't expect. You speak to us through a, a video on Facebook or YouTube. Lord, thank you. Thank you for never stop seeking us, for never stop letting us alone, for always being there for us. And this morning, Lord, don't let anyone click off until you've spoken to them. Thank you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, Amy has some music for us, so let's, let's worship together. Hey guys, my name is Amy. It is so good to be here with you together. Uh, I cannot wait to do some worship today. Uh, it is a beautiful day to start out by worshiping God and remembering who we are in God's love and who God has made us to be. So let's sing together with the lyrics that are going to be on your screen. Bring your tired and bring your shame. Bring your guilt and bring your pain. Don't you know that's not your name? You will always be much more to me. And every day I wrestle with the voices that keep telling me I'm not right. But that's all right, cause I hear a voice and he calls me redeemed. When others say I'll never be enough And greater is the one living inside of me Than he who is living in the world In the world In the world And greater is the one living inside of me Than he who is living in the world And every time I fall, there'll be those who will call me a mistake. But that's okay, cause I hear a voice and he calls me redeemed. When others say I'll never be enough. And greater is the one living inside of me than he who is living in the world. I lose the battle, grace says that it doesn't matter Cause the cross already won the war He's greater, he's greater I'm learning to and freely understand just how he sees me And it makes me love him more and more He's greater, he's greater There'll be days I lose the battle, grace says that it doesn't matter Cause the cross already won the war He's greater, he's greater I'm learning to and freely understand just how he sees me makes me love him more and more. He's greater, he's greater. I hear a voice and he calls me redeemed. When others say I'll never be enough. And greater is the one living inside of me than he who is living in the world. In the world. In the world. And greater is
than he who is living in the world. Amen. Good morning, all my friends joining us on Facebook this morning. Welcome to Sunday morning worship service. I'm so glad you're joining us this morning. My name is Rochelle. I'm the Director of Recovery Ministries here at the Fort Myers campus, and I'm right there in the comments section. So say hi to me. Let me know that you guys are joining us today. And if you're new here, we have a special way for you to get connected. At the bottom of your screen right now is a number that you can text the word hi to. This is so we know that it's your first time here and can follow up with you. So please text that number high if this is your first time. Now, for those of you who have been around a little while, we have another way for you to stay connected with us. And yep, that's those Let's Connect cards I talk about all the time. This is how we stay connected. So follow the link in your comment section or you can text check in to that phone number to let us know you're here. Another cool way to fill out a Let's Connect card is on the Grace Church app. You know, these Let's Connect cards are so important because it's also how we know we can pray for you. So please go fill out your Let's Connect card and let us know how we can pray for you. Now, each week around here at Monday nights, we have Choose Recovery. So what is Choose Recovery? If you're new here, you may be asking, well, we're a group of people who struggle with addictions, afflictions, and compulsive behaviors who gather together to choose recovery through a growing trust in Jesus. He guides us to freedom by following a simple recovery path. No matter where you've been or what you have done, you are welcome to join us. So come join us on Monday nights at 645 right here on Facebook. Now this week, we're going to have a couple of mini testimonies from a variety of addictions, afflictions, and compulsive behaviors. So come check us out tomorrow night at 645. And then at 8 o'clock, we have men's and women's recovery small groups on a program called Zoom. So we would love for you to join us. Now, each week around here on Wednesday nights, we have a midweek worship service with Pastor Ed, and that's at 6.30 live right here on Facebook. So come back, at six, uh, so come back on Wednesdays and, and get a midweek pickup. And then this Saturday coming up will be our men's virtual breakfast. That's Saturday, August 1st at 9.30 a.m. And that's happening right here on Facebook too. We found ways to stay connected to each other even when we can't be in person. And we want to stay connected with you. So join us for any of these times that you have this week. That's all the announcements I have for you this morning. Take it away, Amy. Let's continue to worship.
gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. And you are good, good. Oh, 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 you're never gonna let, never gonna let me. Good morning. My name is Ashley. I'm on the operations team here for Choose Recovery at Grace Church, Fort Myers Central Campus on Monday nights. I'm so glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. And if this is your first time here, or even if you've been here a bunch of times, Rochelle and Pastor Ed and myself are all in the comments section, and we would love to talk with you, take any prayer requests that you have. So go ahead and say hi to us in the chat bar. We're going to go ahead and receive the tithes and the offerings this morning. And we still are doing this just as we normally would if we were together but we're just doing it virtually right now. So right now at Grace Church, we have three different ways to give, and they're going to be up on your screen. You can give through mail, by cash, or check. You can go to egracechurch.com slash give, or you can text the number that's on your screen, and that's pretty simple. All you do is just text the word central and the amount that you want to give, and it'll prompt you from there. So something we're doing right now here at Grace Church is what we're calling our Grace Church COVID-19 Fund. And this is exactly what it sounds like. It's a fund for those affected in our congregation and in our community by COVID-19. So if this is something that you want to get involved in, see the information on your screen for a way that you can get involved in that today. But we do want to remind you that if you have been affected, lost a job, or lost hours due to COVID-19, please do not give, but go to our Get Help, Give Help website and figure out how we can help you today. Let's go ahead and pray this morning. Well, God, we just thank you so much for your presence here with us today. We thank you that you have built a church inside of our homes, Lord. And we pray that you would just take this money that we're putting in the buckets, Lord, this outpouring from our hearts, and you would just multiply it in a way that only you can, so we can continue to partner with you in transforming people into fully devoted disciples of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, see you guys next week. Once again, thank you for joining us. So glad you're here this morning. And you know, I wanted to share a little bit, well, a story from my childhood. And maybe from your childhood as well. Because I know that one of the most vivid memories we can have of our childhood, well, and it may even be embarrassing, but it happens to most of us. Uh, we go to a store with mom and dad. Uh, we see a, a toy or something that we, we want and we ask, but the answer is no. And so we go to plan B, where we take that thing and sneak it into our pocket or maybe into our jacket or somewhere, and we walk out with it. And then a little while later, well, we're busted. Things kind of spiral downward from there. 
Mom and Dad will march us back to that store. They find the manager, and we have to return the item and ask for forgiveness. And then we're made to apologize to probably every employee in the store for stealing. And through most of us, through tears and, and, and shame and fear that they might even call the cops, we find redemption. Because this, is a, this story is a story of redemption. We're taken back to the scene of the crime so that we can have a second chance. Now, I just shared this, and I know many people, because I've talked to a lot of them, have experienced this. I, I did not. Um, the one time that a friend of mine uh, decided we were going to go to a store and steal, uh, he decided that uh, we would get some worms so we could go fishing. Now, I'm not too bright, but even in my mind, I wasn't going to go to jail for stealing worms. So uh, I, I bowed out. But today we're going to look, like, look at an epic fail of the disciple Peter and how Jesus brings him back to the scene of the crime for a second chance. You see, Peter was one of the most outspoken of the disciples. I mean, he, he never did anything halfway. He, he, I mean, with, from walking on water uh, with Jesus to speaking up even when he was wrong, <laughs> Peter always went all in. And so true to form, Peter's epic fail is so famous that when you go to Israel, one of the major stops on the agenda is the scene of Peter's crime. So let me share the story. At Jesus' uh, early uh, earthly ministry was coming to a close, and then Jesus shares a meal with his disciples, and then he actually tells the disciples all that's going to get ready to take place, and soon uh, he will be betrayed, and he will be beaten and crucified and die. And he will be buried. And on the third day, though, God will raise him from the dead. And Peter hears the news and wants Jesus to know that he's up for the challenge. And, and will go with him through it all. Look with me at John 13, 36b through 38, where Jesus gives Peter some sobering news. He says, and Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. But why can't I come now, Lord, he asked. I'm ready to die for you. Jesus answered, die for me. I tell you the truth, Peter. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. You see, Peter thinks he's ready to die for Jesus, but Jesus tells him the truth. Peter, it's not even, you're not even up to living for me, much less dying for me. Here is an early warning sign of a coming crash. You see, Peter is not self-aware. He is confident in himself, and the old proverb is right again. Uh, Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. See, following this exchange, Jesus and his disciples go out to the Garden of Gethsemane so that they can pray. And instead of praying, Peter falls asleep. Another warning, light of a coming fail. Peter's exhausted. Soon Judas comes and betrays Jesus, uh, just as he said it would happen. And, and Peter wakes up and sees the armed soldiers and officers from the high priest's house. And what does Peter do? He draws his sword and starts swinging. Peter cuts off the ear of one of the high priest's servants, and Jesus commands him to put away the sword. And it's ironic that Jesus' last recorded earthly miracle is no is to undo Peter's mistake. Luke records Jesus putting the servant's ear back on. Again, a warning sign. Instead of engaging in prayer, Peter draws a weapon. Isn't it amazing a, a disciple can be with Jesus for three years and experience the teaching and, and on peace and the power of the kingdom of God and still reach for his sword and start swinging? This is another warning. Peter relies on human weapons to fight a spiritual battle. Jesus is taken to the high priest's home. Uh, Peter follows and soon finds himself with the wrong people at the wrong time. Yet another warning sign. Soon he is recognized. He is afraid. 
Fear pushes Peter over the edge. And John was most likely a, an eyewitness to this next scene. Notice the detail he includes in his biography of Jesus in chapter 18. It says, the woman asked Peter, you're not one of the disciples, are you? No, he said, I am not. Because it was cold, the household servants and the guards had made a charcoal fire. They stood around it, warming themselves, and Peter stood with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, as Simon Peter was standing by the fire, warming himself, they asked him again, You're not one of, these, one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, No, I am not. But one of the household slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, didn't I see you out there in the olive grove with Jesus? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately a rooster crowed. Three denials, all because, all beside a, a charcoal fire, an important detail we'll come back to. We know that from other accounts that Peter went out and wept bitter tears. Some scholars point to that uh, Jesus also most likely heard the rooster crow. Peter failed and he knew it. Maybe he began to replay the whole story in his mind. And at this point, did Peter begin to realize that the warning signs that led to this epic fail? Let's trace them back together. Peter was full of pride. He was also tired. He was still relying on human weapons to fight spiritual battles. He was with the wrong people at the wrong time. And Peter was afraid. Now, in my experience, in my own life, as well as hearing the stories from lots of others, epic fails really don't happen in an instant. There's usually a series of choices and smaller denials that lead to the larger ones. People don't all of a sudden erupt in anger, have affairs, overspend, become addicted, drop out of discipleship, become racist, codependent, or greedy in an instant. Usually, if we go back to the scene of the crime, we can piece together where the epic fail began. And before we go back uh, to Peter's story, it seems like this is a time to examine our own hearts. In what ways have I denied Jesus? And it's easy in this type of epic fail to say to ourselves, well, I've never outright denied Jesus like Peter. And when I say this, I... I hear the Holy Spirit saying to me, not so fast, let's take a closer look. What does it mean to deny Jesus? The simple way I find I'm like Peter is that I, I live like Jesus is not my Savior. I live for myself, not for Jesus. This is an age-old tug of war with our sinful nature. The early church leader Paul says that when we follow our sinful nature, the results are very clear and obvious. Right before listing the fruits of the Holy Spirit, Paul gives the list of, um, uh, made even more vivid by the message, paraphrase. And, and so let's ask God to examine our hearts as we look at these words. It says, It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfying wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community, and I could go on. Well, please, no, Paul, stop right there. Don't go on. This partial list is enough for me. I, I'm pretty sure I'm not alone. I, I, I'm afraid that I might hear a rooster crow at any time now. Let me ask again, in what ways have you and I deny Jesus. Maybe it's not on the list of things we, we just read that, or the list of things we've done, but maybe it's on a list of things that, well, we left undone. 
heard a story about a little boy that fell out of bed. And the dad heard the thud and then the crying from the little boy. So he ran in and he said, what happened, son? And the little boy said, I guess I fell asleep too close to where I get up. Sometimes I've stayed too close to the edge. Instead of moving deeper into the life of Jesus that he's inviting me into, Jesus invites us all to live life to the fullest. And we, we don't need to settle. We, we, we need to move on. When we ask Jesus to cover our lives with the Holy Spirit, we find immeasurable amounts of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control emerging from deep down in our soul. Let's get back to the story. Following Peter's denial, Jesus is crucified and dies. And can you imagine the pain that Peter must have been in? Hmm. But on Easter, we see the story makes a sudden turn. Women go to Jesus' tomb to take care of the body, and they discover the tomb is empty. And an angel is there with world-altering news. He is risen. Then the angel has this personalized message. Go tell the disciples and Peter. Jesus wants Peter to know that he's still included. Even if he no longer regards himself as one of the disciples, Jesus' love for him remains steadfast. So what was Peter up to after Jesus is raised from the dead? Well, with his dream of being the rock on which Jesus was to build his church gone, Peter went back to his old life. He went fishing. Always a leader, he convinces some others to go along and follow him. And while they're fishing on, on the same shore next to Capernaum where they first met Jesus three years earlier, the risen Jesus comes seeking Peter out. Jesus has traveled from the grave to new life and now to the shore of the Sea of Galilee to find Peter. The last few yards are kind of up to Peter, though. Look with me to what happens next in John 21, 7 through 9. It says, When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work, jumped into the water, and headed to the shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the load, loaded net to the shore, for they were only about a hundred yards from the shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire, and some bread. See, on the last night they were together, Jesus had served the disciples a meal. And after supper, he had broken the bread and referred to it as his body. Now there they were, the first place they ever met Jesus, remembering the last night they were with him. But there's one more detail that John includes. The fish were cooking by charcoal fire. Peter has been a fisherman, and three years earlier, Jesus had invited him to become a fisher of people, pointing to uh, the fish that they had just caught. Jesus has a question for Peter. John 21, 15 through 17. It says, After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs. Jesus told him, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. See, this is no longer the Last Supper, drawing to a close of Jesus' earthly ministry. This is breakfast, the start of a new day. And three times Jesus has a question for Peter, using his full name, do you love me? Three times Jesus has an assignment for Peter, feed my sheep. But by the third time, Peter is hurt. What is Jesus doing here? Uh, new Testament professor Dr. Ben Witherington says this, 
John has the threefold restoration take place in a setting similar to where the threefold denial did. It's like revisiting the scene of the crime, only this time getting it right. With the smell of the charcoal fire, the sight of broken bread, the location of the shore near Capernaum, asking Peter three questions, all are Jesus bringing Peter back to the scene of the crime. And when it comes to our failures, how many times have we said, if I could just go back and do that over? Jesus gives do-overs. What I love about the story is that Jesus does, not only takes him to the scene of the crime, he, he calls him a second time. Jesus reminds Peter of his mission. When he first called him, he said, Simon, son of John, you will be Cephas, Peter, the rock. Now, Jesus says three times, feed my sheep. Peter's future was a, a shepherd of the early church. And when Jesus asked, do you love me more than these? He's speaking of the fish, the, the way of life, his friends, the boat, and all that he held comfortable. Jesus takes Peter through a process of restoration that involves recalling his failure in the light of his calling. But this is the second calling that requires a new attitude. This is an invitation to powerlessness and humility, dependence on Jesus. Jesus adds the important detail about what it looks like to live as a grown-up disciple. It says, I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. So make no mistake, Jesus is describing a willing powerlessness and surrender. This is not letting others make decisions for him in some form of codependency. No, Jesus is inviting Peter to be so deeply in love with him and so ready to trust him that he's willing to go anywhere for him, even if it's painful, always trusting that with him, Peter will find life and find it abundantly. The rest of Peter's life will be marked by you humility, not pride. Jesus gives Peter a second chance and a second calling. And what is Jesus saying to you and I through this story? Look with me at the big idea for today. Jesus offers me a second chance and a second calling. Today, Jesus wants to give someone listening a story to this story, a second chance. First, Jesus offers his forgiveness. Jesus' death on the cross was a sufficient penalty for our sin and our failure. And Jesus' resurrection from the dead offers us new life. Grace fits epic failures like Peter's and like yours and mine. Let's come back now to the scene of the crime. Agree that we need a second chance re and receive his forgiveness. But there's more. Not only is there a second chance, Jesus never wastes a failure. Peter's Failure, as well as ours, is an opportunity for maturity. Jesus asks, do you love me more than your own way? Do you love me more than your comfort? Do you love me more than your pride? Do you love me more than anything or anyone? In the depth of our failure, can we encounter a new depth of Jesus' love? Jesus calls to us again. The first calling was easy to to this one, the, the, the calling is a, a, a calling to follow him, even though it means dying to our pride. And Jesus has a calling on your life and mine to change this world for God and for good. This certainly was true in Peter's life. Peter went to be filled with the Holy Spirit and, 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 the, and with power and preached the first sermon after Jesus ascends to heaven. He goes to become a leader of the early church fishing for people, and feeding Jesus' sheep. And Jesus takes an epic failure, and with the gifts of a second chance and a second calling, our world will never be the same. The encouragement of uh, Pastor John Maxwell is spot on. He says, 
God uses people who fail because there aren't any other kind of people around. Let me say it again. The, the grace of Jesus fits epic failures like yours and mine. And in this series, we've seen it time and time again. No matter if your failure is a spiritual failure like Peter, no matter if your failure is a failure of self-awareness and an emotional burnout like Elijah, no matter if your failure is a relational failure like Paul and Barnabas, no matter if your failure is one where things beyond your control and life circumstances fail us like Naomi, Jesus never fails us. His love never fails. His forgiveness never fails. His power never fails. His promises never fail. And let me just testify to the unfailing love of Christ Jesus our Lord. So even now in those places of weakness in my life and yours, let us delight in the grace of Jesus Christ. Let us claim the hope that he offers to us on Easter. Because Jesus has overcome even death. No failure has to be final. God can change a mess into a masterpiece. Jesus can make our wreckage into righteousness. God can turn our mourning into dancing. God alone can lift our sorrows. In Christ, you can be a new creation transformed by his glory. God can bring even the dead to life and can save a wretch like me. And God can save a wretch like you too. So if you're lost, in him you can be found. When we are at our worst, God gives us his best. While we're yet sinners, Christ died for you and me. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank you. I thank you that you love this this much, that we get second chances, and third, and fourth, and fifth. Lord, you, you never leave us alone. And although we may fail epically, Lord, you're always there to pick us up, dust us off, and remind us who we are, children of God and persons of worth. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us this way. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, Amy's going to do one more song for us. And as she does that song, I invite you to spend the time in prayer. Jesus has a calling on your life. And this may be the second calling. It may be a time to come back around to the scene of the crime, receive his forgiveness, and the second calling he has upon you. Because he does have a plan and a purpose for you. So during this time, I invite you to pray. And if you've not followed Jesus, if this is your first time uh, saying yes to him, I invite you to text the number that's on your screen right now. And I want to give you some next steps. Some, so I want to be able to get you a Bible if you don't have one. I want to be able to uh, celebrate with you this new life, this new journey that's ahead of you. But as Amy sings for us, I know it's hard to not listen to the singing and follow along with words and sing ourselves, but I invite you to pray. Amy, play for us. Yeah.
you, Amy. Thank you so much. And I hope that maybe God has spoken to you during this time. I know he's spoken to me. Sometimes I need it the worst, I think. But I also want you to know that he loves you and he is a God of second chances or maybe more. And he has something for you. He is a calling, a plan, and a purpose. So this week, live into that. Live into that calling that he has on your life. Live into that purpose he has for you. And I want you to remember a couple of things. First off, choose recovery tomorrow night at 645. Be there. I'll be in the comments. Say hello. Wednesday night, 630. Be there for that. Uh, once again, I'll be in the comments. I want to say hello. I want us to be in connection as much as we can during this time. We need to feed our faith and not our fears. So remember those things. And remember one more thing. Remember that Jesus loves you, and so do I. God bless you all.